And I, I really want to talk about one text uh, that has really been forgotten in translation studies. It's Derrida, Die Trat à la Philosophie, which the right to philosophy, on the right to philosophy. Of course, it's always going straight to philosophy, as one expects. In Derrida, nothing is simple, especially in titles. And it's a continued reflection on higher education, particularly on the place of philosophy within higher education, but also other issues. The relation between higher education and the state, in particular, philosophy and the state, philosophy and state languages. And uh, it's a whole nest of very interesting problems for which the main solution is this term translation. And this, this quite uh, long book constitutes Derrida's major reflection on translation and it really hasn't been picked up. I'm aware of just one lecture by, by the much regretted Daniel Simeone uh, on this text. Uh, people, Derrida has a text, De Tour de Babel, which is his title in English, on, on Benjamin, and people refer to that. But this is a much richer reflection for the kinds of problems that I think we're dealing with here. Now, when uh, Derrida gets to translation, he uses the term in specific concept, contexts. In particular, uh, the way that a philosopher writing in French will read and use and rework, in this case, philosophers writing in German. Uh, so the first major reference comes out to his work on uh, reading uh, Heidegger, as we would expect. And he says that as we do this, we enter into Heidegger's text, we become aware that we're not translating phrases or sentences, we know this, but a whole system of references and terms that Heidegger calls Denken, does Denken, to think, okay? And that this system is what we have to bring across. Then, of course, that system is embedded in a particularly German institution, and we have to negotiate the differences between the institutions involved. And that's what the, the latter part of this book does. Let me focus, however, on this uh, shift of position that happens as we engage in this translation process. We move into another place of sense or of meaning, into the space and the times of a translation of thought. Uh, you'll pick out, of course, that there's a shift here from uh, uh, pensé as a verb, to denken as a verb. This is an activity, a process, uh, that finishes up with the nouns, uh, translation, and thought. There's a shift between the process and the product there, which remains problematic. And you'll find that the underlying process at stake here, the verb that's setting up all of this, is uh, tradition, to translate the action of translating becomes that of thinking and the style of reading producing translation and thought. Uh, what interests me here is uh, the rendition, if you like, of das Denken, the verb to think as a substantive, is in uh, Derrida here, the verb translation. And this is a constant throughout this quite long text. Why? does Derrida insist on this special place for this activity of translation? Well, the first reason is that it's his own practice in this text and many others. Um, this is just an example. It's a whole lot of French. If you don't know French, that's fine. What you should be able to pick out is he's reading the German terms. That's a bit of German, okay? It's a phrase from Kant. Uh, it can be translated as, one can only learn philosophy, one can only learn to philosophize, one can learn to philosophize only, and so on. And the act of translating, in this case into French, the problems of which options you choose, creates this space and time of translation. 
How do we render it? What is in that German? It could be this, or this, or this. And this is the process that Derrida uses in his own verbal action of thinking, translating, philosophizing, if you like. It all becomes one. What interests me here in this particular text is at the end, <clears throat> the action of translation marks out the difference. <clears throat> His aim is not to produce the correct reading of Kant, although he often delights in correcting the standard translators, uh, but of producing equivocation, l'équivoque, the place of the standing ambiguity of it could be that or that or that, and we don't really know. Uh, this aiming for equivocation instead of aiming for equivalence, which is what standard translation theory might want him to do, uh, transforms this into a method of thought rather than a production of products, products in the sense of a standalone translation. So here we're aware that he is translating. He's translating as a way of reading, as a way of interpreting. It's an entirely hermeneutic operation for which the standalone product, the translation that replaces the start text, is not an issue. We're going to show philosophy as this process, this ongoing process, which in turn is an invitation uh, for others to continue. The term equivocation, equivoc, here uh, has been picked up by Brazilian anthropology, uh, a writer in Rio de Janeiro, who, who proposes that in the kind of cultural translation we have in anthropology, the aim should be equivocation. I originally thought it was a cult from Spanish. Equivocation in Spanish is a mistake. Uh, here, it's not. It's uh, an ongoing, substantive, durable, multiple ambiguity. We live with these uh, problematics that are not entirely solved. So much for the space and the practice. It's a constant in Derrida. I've used it myself in some texts. Douglas Robinson these days is producing two books a year, simply doing this, picking up great texts and reading them in detail and interrogating them to tease out meanings we didn't see were there, hopefully to solve problems along the way. Now, Derrida is trying to solve problems in this text. Uh, it's a text of uh, occasional papers, papers written to address problems that were his along the way, and the foundational problems uh, were problems. Were that after years of having been a maître assistant, which would be an assistant professor in France, well below his academic status, in 1984 he was at last elected to a position at the L'Ecole Institute of the School of, of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. So at last he had some academic recognition in France. And at the same time, 1983 was the foundation of the International College of Philosophy, of which he was the first director. Now, those two things were problematic. For um, the college, the, the international People said it was Mitterrand's gift to him to have him stay in France. And it's a state-subsidized institution, it still is today, founded, as Derrida himself says in the text, in the presence of three ministers. So it's three ministries that are involved in this. But Derrida poses the question, am I therefore working for the French state? And he insists, that the college and philosophy was self-founded in the presence of the French state. But this was a climate where Mitterrand had recently come to power and the general talk among intellectuals of the left was to participate. And this was his act of participation, somewhat reluctantly one feels. Now, in talking about that self-foundation of philosophy being uh, using money from the state but not being responsible to the state, this space of translation becomes a very, very key kind of answer. It's a difficult problem for most of us, I hope, and it's a, 
an essential problem in translation studies since, I believe, 2002 and 3. Uh, could you imagine me saying that you are all receiving money from the state of the United Kingdom and you are therefore guilty of an illegal war in Iraq and other iniquities enacted by this government and I will boycott all of you because of it, because you belong to the state. That has happened in translation study. Oh, not for you, but for Miriam Schlesinger and Gideon Turi, uh, to, in whose honor I owe it to myself to mention this fact. This has been a problem for us in translation studies. It might be good to look at how Derrida addressed this problem, rather than be involved in rather absurd discussions about which country is worse. Derrida's answer in the College of Philosophy is twofold. One, it's international, which means multilingual and inviting people in from other countries. Okay? And the second is that philosophy will intersect with all other fields of thought in the humanities as much as possible. And this is, this is the original, and it's still the menu of activities. We look at philosophy engaging with, and that line, that, what do you call that? That line, that, that relationship is translation. Translation is used to describe those intersections between disciplines. And the work of philosophy is to enact those intersections. Now, in the text, dealing with that problem, translation is more than a metaphor. In, in, in much of what we read, it's a convenient metaphor for any discipline that was held back by binary divisions or national boundaries that no longer mean very much. Translation comes in as, oh, this other thing that lets us get rid of that previous paradigm. Here, though, it is thought through in the terms of linguistic translation. For example, the imposition of French as a national language is rewritten, following Baliba, but rewritten as a prohibition to translate into other languages and an obligation to translate into French. That is, that the national language French became a national language through translation policy, notably prohibition of other languages receiving translations. Logically, if you are working in a space of translation, you can bring out translation practices that oppose the translation practices that institute the, the, the state language. So translation becomes something that's working on both sides of this opposition. And you are, are enabled, you're, you're able to engage with it because it's the same activity but using different directionalities and different modalities on, uh, on both sides. Not by chance, uh, Antoine Bernard gave his first lectures at the college in 1984, that is straight after the, the foundation of it. I was very pleased to do the same thing ten years later, at the stage I was just a postdoc from Göttingen in Germany. Uh, I didn't deserve that honor, but there it was. And translation is still there at the moment. There's a seminar on uh, uh, Poétique des Intraduisibles, uh, the poetics of untranslatables, given half in Rio de Janeiro and half in Paris. So translation has been there in this institution. It has been working with the support of the state, but it's been working to do more than a court intellectual, if you will, or a support of a national language. The main text on translation in this book comes later though. It's when Derrida looks at prior examples where people have attempted to solve this problem. The problem of what we're doing with relation to the state and languages. Uh, Kant, the Streit der Fakultät, the conflict of faculties, uh, took a position 
in 98, 1798, so we're going right back, right back to a stage in Germany where the state was not a negative thing. The state was a, 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 the future of the Germanic people and, and the language and the culture. It was a dynamic, organic thing that people wanted to participate in. And uh, Kant uh, recognizes that there are some faculties that should be under state control and other faculties that should not in a rather strange division that I haven't got time to go into here. Derrida's concern is not so much with, with that as with Schelling's critique of it. In these lessons, these lectures that, that Schelling gives in 1802, 1803, referring back to Kant and taking issue with these divisions between the faculties and that some should be controlled and others shouldn't found that a rather bizarre way to proceed. Schelling takes the position that the divisions between our academic discourses are false. Uh, he insists, for example, that there is poetry in philosophy and philosophy in poetry. And there should be philosophy in uh, literary criticism, for example. Uh, just as there is philosophy in mathematics and beauty in mathematics. And, and this kind of comparison finds very quickly relations between all the existing disciplines. Derrida is obviously very pleased because he writes well, and, and yes, there is a lot of poetry in, in Derrida, uh, as anybody who likes good French can appreciate, I think. This means that with respect to philosophy, Schelling is right up front and says, no, philosophy is not one that should be controlled by the state. It's not even one that should be in its own faculty. This philosophy should be everywhere in all the studies. It should be everywhere and nowhere. It should be the activity that finds the relations between the existing disciplines. And Derrida quite consciously picks up the Beziehungen, the, the relations, and says, ah, I'm going to translate that as translation. Philosophy is the activity that finds the translations between the disciplines. I should also note Derrida's writing at the time of Michel Serre, L'Introduction, who does these wonderful things of, of you know, notably thermodynamics being translated into Turner's paintings, uh, finding these relationships between art and thought and science uh, called translation. So Derrida is not the first to go down that road. This means that for Schelling, in this vision, the university is a system of translations in the sense that it's a university to take the different fields of knowledge and attempt to make them one. Uniformation. Uh, that is also, as Derrida says, a poetics of translation. Um, Schelling, being a good Christian, goes a little bit further and says that in discovering the relations between all the fields of science, we are coming closer to nature, which is the essence of God, and discovering how to supplement that nature. Uh, Derrida strangely forgets about deconstruction at this moment and rather likes this great aspiration. <laughs> to a rather complete knowledge. He insists on the supplement bit. Supplement was in the, his discourse at that time, and that's okay. But you can see this aspiration to a more complete kind of knowledge that can be related through translations between disciplines is definitely appealing, definitely what he would like to see happening in his own college in Paris. I hasten to add, that the term deconstruction was not used in this text at all. The main text, the reading of Shelley, uh, I first read in German, strangely enough. It was translated in a book in uh, 97 uh, on translation and deconstruction, even though the text doesn't use the term deconstruction, and Derrida uh, would say this thing people call deconstruction, uh, to sort of hold it at arm's length. Uh,
But it had an impact uh, through that text in German thought. You pick it up. I haven't found it referenced in English text except for the Simeone, but I, my knowledge is limited. Uh, Derrida makes the point that this kind of translation activity is necessarily reflexive, and you can see that happening in his text and his mode of reasoning. And so the appeal to reflexive translation, being opposed to product-based translation or non-hermeneutic or equivalence type translation, has been a constant in German thought. From this text, also from Gadamer and the noble hermeneutic tradition that has become strong in Germany. So when uh, Dilek Dizda in Germersheim has a research group uh, uh, on politics of translation, she is definitely talking about what she calls reflexive translation, which is this kind of activity. And her teaching is literally this kind of activity, is getting Heidegger and how is he translated into all these different languages. Let's get down with the text and discuss it and see what happens in the languages, why it happens, why we can look, they improve and learn from each other. The other main impact within Germanic translation studies has been on what they call cultural translation. It's not quite the same as what cultural translation is in this country. But this has spawned projects to extend translation studies into all fields. Uh, this is a text by Bachmann Medic. The whole issue is dedicated to this, of basically to her idea of a translational turn, not in translation studies, where we've had all the turns we can handle, but in the humanities, where she's observing this tendency for, for many uh, people working, not just in, in literary studies, uh, but in anthropology, um, in sociology, in economics even, where they have a cross-cultural comparative perspective to start to use the term translation to look for these kinds of connections. So she's suggesting that people in translation studies, that's you and me, I guess, uh, should be quite good at analyzing not just translations, but all situations of global encounters, uh, all research practices, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. We can take on the world. You see that, that aspiration that was in Schelling, that was a temptation to Derrida, is very much a project for this kind of cultural translation in Germany, with very good sociologists especially on board. Uh, Joaquin Ren is, is, is a sociologist I read with great pleasure, and he is looking at complex multicultural societies and the relations between the groups in terms of translation. And I think that's, that's very good sociology. Or at the network theory in French is called uh, sociologie de la traduction, uh, uh, translation and sociology. And they're doing very similar things. So it's not just uh, some people who are specialists in literatures and languages saying, oh, good, I'm going to explain the whole world now. It does involve working with specialists from other disciplines. That said, I find very little close analysis of what translation means. Uh, Bachmann Medic says we should take the translation concept and say what is transfer, what is mediation, what is metaphor, what is a linguistic dimension, and so on. I find very little of that kind of close analysis. In this country, there is a rather wider and a more embedded tradition of cultural studies, going back to Raymond Williams and others. And so cultural translation um, has taken root rather easily, but in a different kind of sense, uh, not related to the hard sciences, not really related to sociology, as far as I can tell, as has been the case in the Germanic tradition. So when I turn to uh, Sarah Maitland's book, What is Cultural Translation, coming out this year, I find a lot of hermeneutics, a lot of recur, a lot of relations between self and others and hermeneutic movement, a lot of theory, as we defended yesterday, and a few examples. And the examples leave me perplexed. This is where I'm going to lead 
to a critique of all the good things I've been presenting to you. Okay. Now, Sarah gave a talk in Nottingham last year on this, and you'll see her there. Lovely person, lovely presenter, really good hand-drawn slides. You can see the recur hermeneutic movement and stuff. And, and you can see me, this is reflexive translation study, folks. That's, that is my hate <laughs> reflecting cultural studies to you. <laughs> okay. I, would, I, I just found it on a website, on a blog of somebody else who was there. And, and she complained, the, the blogger started off saying, Anthony Pym started saying that we live, all live in multicultural, multilingual societies, and uh, because of that multiplicity, we all translate a bit. And, and the, the girl listening was somewhere in the back, she was editing the film or something, I don't know. And she said, I only speak English. I can't engage in this. He's excluded me. And I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, if I thought about it, I would have said, yes, there are levels of English and translation within English. Fine, we could have handled that problem. But um, I was the bad guy in that blog, and Sarah came in with this wonderful model where everybody is translating all the time. And the blogger was very happy, uh, which is why she put the back of my head in that photo, I guess, as a kind of revenge. Uh, Sarah's uh, example in that lecture, I hope she doesn't mind me, what was in the blog, so I'm citing a blog and that's public knowledge, was a, a case in the elections, the American presidential elections, where candidate Donald Trump accused her candidate Hillary Clinton of playing the woman card. You know, you're going to get votes because you're a woman. That's not fair. And so the Hillary camp comes up with this wonderful retort, which is producing the woman card that you can go and get from them. And this wonderful card, providing membership to the Club of Women, gives you a right to a 17% discount in your salaries, among many other <laughs> negative benefits. Okay. Really, really a clever piece of electioneering. Okay. And uh, Sarah says, well, look, this is cultural translation. You've picked up a meme out there, used in one way on one side, the women's card, and you've translated that into a physical event which transforms the nature of the meme and turns it back on itself. Good. <coughs> Good. Very good. I mean, yes. <laughs> what is it that bothers me here? What is it deep down that, that says, yes, that's exciting stuff to do and let's go ahead with it, but something in me says, wait a minute, what is it? It's because that kind of thing, but not, uh, that, that's just one example, other things, things other than language translation are occupying the space of our training. I mentioned the course that I'm planning to give in Melbourne, uh, that's for all languages. I've called that language translation, in part because there's a medical faculty that uses translation in sense of the transfer of knowledge, and that's really interesting stuff to look at, but I'm looking at translation between languages, okay? And I think there are skills there that are rather different rather harder, let's say, than the general kind of stuff you could include in this all-embracing cultural translation. Now, you'll see that some countries, France notably, has a lot of language-specific classes in their masters. These are programs in the European Masters of Translation. Happily, uh, Lancaster is not there, so you're safe. I'm not gonna... But you'll see that it's not specific. In the UK, um, if you pick on the, you know, if you're not good at languages, but you want to get a master's in translation, you can avoid the optional ones and just go for the ones that are obligatory. The average is, is about 15%. That is, in your master's in translation, an average of 15% will be language-specific classwork. 
you'll do a translation. That'll be outsourced to a professional translator who will give you feedback on it. But I mean, is that what you, you could have done that anyway? It would be much cheaper. Uh, but is that what you're paying these huge fees for to come down for just 15% of that kind of class activity? Uh, in the UK, this is the breakdown. This is taken from websites and we have confirmed it with the program coordinators who have deigned to reply to us. You will notice that an EMT, European Masters of Translation Studies, at the University of Hull, according to the website that we looked at in 2015, had no language requirements. Guess where Sarah Maitland was working? Guess where cultural translation really comes into its own? And that for most of the others, not all, it's variable, the percentage of obligatory language-specific classes is below 20%. <coughs> I understand the problem. This is exactly the problem I'm dealing with. If I want to do Chinese where I can just turn on the tap and fill up the number of students, along with Spanish, French, German, whatever, where I find it difficult to get students, all I have to do is make the common classes a huge percentage. And the higher the percentage of classes in common, the more money I'm making from this master's. Okay? And that's what's happening, I think. I don't know. But I know in my situation, when I have discussions with our dean, that's it. It's a calculation of how much money we want and how much we really care about the language skills of those students doing translation and their capacity to move out from the masters into the market. These are one-year masters, so that's 20% of one year. At least in Melbourne I have a two-year masters, I have, we have a two-year masters, uh, which currently has about 80% language specific. Okay? And there's a difference in the kind of student you're producing there. What bothers me, and this is just to conclude, what bothers me, I think, deep down, is that a lot of the work we're doing, it's not about languages, not about language translation, is exciting stuff, it's great theory, it can constitute that shelling-type vision of the university and the connections. It's a wonderful research activity. And let it proceed. Yes, but there is something else. Derrida is not cited a lot in translation studies because at the end of the day, he had a very conservative view of translation. It did concern languages. It did concern trying to get things to line up at marveling and, 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 and having a productive use when they don't line up. He was talking about, to solve his problems, another place of meaning the time and place of translating thought. And in a lot of the work we're giving, a lot of the things we're looking at in so-called cultural translation and theories, we're talking about translation. We're not on the level of the difficulties of movement between languages, where what is at stake is that intimate relationship between language and thought. If we lose that, we are at serious risk of deprofessionalizing the translators we produce. Thank you very much.